there are powers on Earth too hidden to be seen, and conspiracies too vast to comprehend. For years, the world has seen fact distorted, reality manipulated, and the truth concealed. Join the Pierre Sebac Podcast to uncover the real meanings behind ancient aliens and their symbolism. Hi, this is Pierre Sebac, Unlocking the Keys to the Mysteries. Now, I'm going to um, be looking at a very controversial issue today. We're going to be looking at angelology, which is the study of angels. Um, now, again, um, in terms of the ranking and listing of angels, um, I've made um, a reference before that the angels are angelic sailors. Again, we've also made this um, reference to the idea that the angels or the angelic tradition or naval tradition is compartmentalized. It's compartmentalized into two separate traditions, which is the human tradition and the non-human tradition. Uh, the seraphic tradition, which is the non-human element, and then the cherubim, which are the human tra um, tradition. Uh, this, again, would be linked in with the Ishim, which are the Adamic angels. So, um, I, I want to look at the listings of the different types of angels and maybe offer a little bit of commentary and look at some of the controversies as well um, behind some of the listings. So, if we look at the basic word angelology, it's, it really is the study of angels, okay? And in many respects, um, angelology is very similar to scaphology, which is the study of angelic vessels. But the terminology angelic vessels has this um, connotation of the angelic sailor. So in order to understand the angels, you have to under understand their vessels and the relationship between the two. So angelology um, is the study of angels. Now, to put this simply, it's the religious doctrine which concerns angels, and according to St. Ambrose, um, he was writing around 330 AD, um, the angels are hierarchical, and they are um, very much um, listed or grouped together as a military grouping, and this is because we said before that the word Thaboeth, angelic host, has this connotation of um, of a military host, or, or of a, a military or an army host. So, he arranged them into the ninefold celestial hierarchy. Now, what's interesting about nine is that the word, um, um, sorry, that the the number nine, it's an odd number, and the odd number traditionally um, represents the dragon. Now, the reason for this is if you take an odd number, so for example, we take the number um, five and you double it, then you get an even number, which is traditionally used to represent man. So in this respect, all odd numbers can be converted to even numbers, but an even number cannot be converted to an odd number. If you take two fives and add them to, um, sorry, if you take the 10 and add 10 plus 10, um, you would still get an even number. So the odd numbers, they have mastery or they command, they have a command over even numbers. So in this respect, the odd number represents a dragon, the dragon has command over humanity. So, uh, we see then that Ambrose is making a distinction here with the ninefold celestial hierarchy. Traditionally, odd numbers was used to represent the dragon. So, again, in this respect, we would be looking here at the seraphic tradition. Now, I'm going to try and offer some of my own commentaries when I, I read through the list of the different angels. Um, it, it's by no means definitive. Um, again, um, the um, gradings themselves um, are, are very complex, that they play into different etymologies, and that there are certain symbolic um, connotations behind the wordings, very subtle nuances. So we're going to try and look at what some of these nuances may be. Um, now, I'm also going to look at, at two different um, angelological lists. So one is by St. Ambrose, and then the other is um, by Moses ben Maimon. Now, he was uh, writing in 1135 
to 1204 AD, so somewhere around that um, that time period, um, he was um, a scholar of um, of Judaism. His tradition is very closely related to the Kabbalistic tradition. So we're going to have a look at um, his listing and see how the two listing of angels how they agree and disagree. Now. We can see then that um, there is then that they're complementary. The Christian and the Jewish inventory of angels, although they're similar and they incorporate a general degree of crossover, um, again, they are emphasizing different theological perspectives. And these different theological perspectives are coming from um, different elements of the priesthood. And we will try and explore this in, in, in this video. So... I want to now look at um, traditional Christian angiology. Um, and this was um, written by Ambrose. So as we said before, there are nine um, groups of angels. Um, nine in this case would be representing the dragon because the odd numbers have possession over even numbers. So right at the top of this list is, well, it's, it's quite unusual, but in fact, it's actually revealing a truth because at the top of the list, we would expect the Elohim, but in fact, we've got the Seraphim. But when we look into the etymologies of um, the Elohim, we see that the Elohim themselves are viewed as the seraphim. So, for example, Yahweh's name has a close connotation of um, a seraph. And I will look into this in further videos. Um, but again, if we looked at, for example, the Elohim, the high ones, um, the word is closely linked into Ir, which is a watcher. Um, so in the ancient Semitic Il, um, or El, a god, is closely grouped with Ur, which is a, a watcher. The watchers are the Erin, are described in apocryphal literature as um, looking like vipers or serpents. So therefore they're rendered in the Greek as a dracon. Um, they appear again in the Semitic languages as a seraphim, serepha, which is fire, hence um, and sofeph, which is a watcher. Hence this relationship in, in the Hebrew between Ur, which is a watcher, and Or, which is light. But the Erin themselves are sometimes referred to as, as the watchers or the shining ones. So it's working on this polymorphic symbolism. Anyway, so at the top of our list we have the seraphim. Now the seraphim in this respect are viewed as being synonymous with the Elohim. Directly under this command structure, we have what are known as the proto-humans, or the cherubim. So these are human angels. I use the terminology proto-human because I think when you begin to really look and deconstruct the symbolism, that there is a difference between what is an Adamic angel, which is a, an a Homo sapien, and then a cherubim, which seems to be this proto-human bloodline. Now... <clears throat> Sorry, in, in my book, I've argued that the um, that the Adamic man was created as a conduit in order to um, in order to be genetically compatible both with the seraphim and the cherubim. So number two on the list is the cherubim. Number three, we have the thrones. Now this is very interesting because the throne within symbolism is typically combined with the wheel. So in this respect, this would be the throne chariot. Now this is a heavenly throne chariot. So the throne itself represents jurisdiction over the earth, but is combined with the wheel, which is a symbol in the ancient Semitic languages of a flying saucer. So this is a direct loop to the opening wheels. The opening wheels materialise are, are, are spinning circles. It comes from the etymology um, pana, which is to turn around. So ofana wheel is a spinning wheel and appears or materialise in relation to angels, typically crew members of a naval vessel, which are depicted either as human or and or seraphim. In many traditions, such as in the traditions of Enoch, they appear together. So the human and non-human angels appear together. The seraphim and the cherubim often work in collusion. But as I've said before, in terms of the occult tradition, they can some. They are often seen as being antithetical. Uh, so we have this um, juxtaposition between the human tradition, the angelic human tradition, and the angelic non-human tradition, and um, this tension, hence the splitting between the priesthood which is um, between the human faction and the non-human factions. So we have the thrones, which are another reference to the opening wheels, to the angelic vessels. Number four, we have the um, 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 domin um, dominations, which are the daemons. So there's a connotation there of um, the daemons. Again, um, the daemons is related in Greek um, to de um, 
it is related to the word for people because the daemons are seen as being a type of people as also with the jinn in the arabic as well now fo um, closely followed we have the virtues or a saint or a virgin um, so the, the virtues are this um, planted offspring um, which are venerated and which are this uh, human offspring which are planted by the angels um, after um, number six we have the powers of the celestial hosts so these are the celestial hosts or the mysteries which interface um, with human beings or the principalities which appear as number seven now the principalities are the archons the etymology of archon is related to a ruler or an angel again in the greek archon is closely related to noarchos which is a naval cap captain um, and um, olkos which is a, a naval vessel Again, so there is this, if we rendered this in the Semitic, we'd see there would be a relationship between the um, Kerab and Kubtan, which is a, a captain, or Karib, which is a boat, a small boat. Um, number eight, we have the Archangels. Now, the Archangels, again, Arch um, is a close cognate of Archon, which is a ruler. So they um, intersect with the earthly dom domain or the terrestrial angels, the angels which have been planted. And then lastly, we have the angels which are messengers. OK, so this is just Angelos, which is um, an angel or a messenger, um, one who delivers a message. Again, this is this um, interplay between the human element and the non-human element. And now this um, actually... Um, how this relates to what I refer to as the Paro Society. The Paro Society is the ship of state, and now the ship of state is anchored or moored to heaven, in which these emissaries communicate um, with human and non-human and grafted elements. So, um, that is um, the Christian tradition. Um, now, there are m we also need to remember that there were many of these different lists which were, um, which were written, and there were many if you like many wars were fought over um, the different elements in terms of um, whether angels should whether people should venerate the the non-human angels or whether they should follow the human angels so again this is a very controversial area and is an area in in which theologically there were many um, areas of content, um, contention so I don't want by giving you these lists I don't want you to think that this is a definitive list uh, these lists are contextual they depend on uh, which part of the priesthood are representing these ideas whether they are affiliated to the human angels or non-human angels now we're going to have a look now at the rabbinical scholar and his list um, now his name was Boses, um, Moses Ben Maimon he's, no, he's known more commonly within occult writing as Maimondes now he lists the governing angels in his book Mishnah Torah which um, translated academically means the exegetical teachings of the Torah so the interpretations of the Torah now he gave um, his list of angels as follows now this is the tenfold rank of angels so this would have um, a human connotation behind the list and actually um, and, and so this is very interesting because this is in contrast, if you like, to the seraphic angels which were given earlier by um, Ambrose. So, um, number one on the list, we have the Kayot HaKodesh, which are the holy living creatures. The holy living creatures uh, typically surround the throne of God. As we said before, the throne is often combined with the wheel and is represented as a chariot. So this is a throne um, chariot. A throne of God which rules or presides over the earth is a chariot, but the chariot in this respect is used to represent the opening wheels or the spinning wheels. So these are the um, creatures which surround or protect the throne chariot or, or the chariot of God, which in today's parlance would be understood as a flying saucer, as a spinning wheel, the opening wheels. Underneath that, to complement that idea, indeed we have the opening wheels. Now, very interestingly and very controversially, we have what um, are listed as the um, Erelim. Again, th this is kind of um, very interesting because interesting, there's a word play on Ur, which is a watcher, which would have a connotation of a viper or a seraph. But in this respect, um, the Erelim refers to the valiant or the courageous ones. Now, it's coming from the etymology of Arya, which is a lion. Now, this is interesting because, again, it's working on cleleptical symbolism. So we take the Hebrew word Arya, which is a lion, and we render that um, as the other word for lion in Hebrew, which is Lavi, which is a lion. 
and the lion is used to represent uh, the human, sometimes also the grafted area as well, because the lion is is uh, is found within the symbolism of Orion, which denotes this grafted bloodline. But th certainly, the lion is used to represent um, the priesthood or human elements or grafted elements of the priesthood. So we have Lavi, which is a lion. Levi, uh, which are the priests, which would be represented as the Lion of Judah. Um, and again, the lion is is, predator, uh, is a predator. It's one who watches and so feeds into the symbology of the serpent. The lion and the serpent are often combined together within occult symbolism, which is denoting the human and non-human um, element. So, for example, you might find... Um, so, on, on a Star Trek e episode, um, there was... Um, a non-human creature which was combined with a cat um, within animations as well um, the cat is often combined combined with a serpent or a reptile and this is found throughout occult symbolism now number four on our list we've got the um, ashmalim it's translated according to the septuagint as amber again this is a clay leptical symbol because the word amber Karubo in Arabic, amber, which has this connotation of electricity, is related to the cherubim. And so the stone amber is used to represent um, the cherubim. So here we have um, words which have been switched around. So you take the word amber and you give it the alternative meaning in, in the same language, which is a clay leptical symbol. And then that will give you then the connotation of what's the real connotation. So number four, we've got um, ashmalim. But the Ashmalim refers to amber, which is used as a signifier to, to denote the cherubim. Number five, and this is very controversial and wars have been fought over this, uh, the seraphim. So they're number five. So they're not at the top of the list um, anymore. If we noted in the, um, tradi in the Christian um, list by Ambrose, he listed the seraphim as the top dog. So in other words, he is coming from the Pythagorean tradition, the Puthos Agoras, the speaker of the serpent, the Pythagorean tradition within the Greek tradition. Um, but no, um, we've got in the Jewish or in the rabbinical tradition with the seraphim uh, in the middle of the list. Okay, uh, so number six, we've got the Malachim, the messengers or the angels. Now, We've got um, the Malachim, uh, the um, Malak, um, again it's a, a paranomasia on the word Malak, which is a sailor, otherwise an angelic sailor. As we've said before, the angels, Malak and angel is a cognate of Malak, which is a sailor. Now, again, this is immensely controversial. I mean, if you, if you understand the symbology of this, this is, um, Mayor Mondes is a complete radical. He's put the Elohim, right? As number seven, if we remember in the Bible, Yahweh Sabaoth is described as an Elohim. It's the Lord of the host. Um, the terminology Yahweh Sabaoth appears multiple times throughout the Bible and he's referred to as an Elohim. Sometimes he's referred to as um, a Malach Elohim, uh, a, a, mess a, a messenger God or um, a an, um, an angel god however you want to translate that word but the angels and the Elohim are seen and viewed as being one and the same thing so number seven we've got the Elohim and below the Elohim are the Bene Elohim, the sons of the gods okay so the sons of the gods in the biblical tradition in Genesis 6 mated um, with the daughters of man which were deemed as being fair and they created the Nephilim the word Nephilim has this connotation of a, a giant or, or one who is fallen but again it's related astrologically in the Aramaic to Nephilia which is the star system um, which is which is the star system of Orion the uh, Nephilim are, are again often represented as the Gibberim Gibor or Gibor which is Orion so um, we've got the Elohim, which are um, fairly low down on the list. Now, again, very interestingly, he's, he's put number nine as the cherubim. So the cherubim are below the Bene Elohim, the sons of the gods. Um, the cherubim are referred to, the, the word cherub is coming from the Hebrew word kerev, which is a sword. So the cherubim are traditionally represented with the sword. I translate the word cherubim as the armed ones. But um, we could also... Um, translate the word satisfactory as a marine and the w reason why I translate the word as a marine because the the word sword also um, care of a sword is close related to carib which is a a, um, a, sh a small ship or a vessel so the, the caribim in this respect are seen to be an armed contingent from a, a vessel 
and they have a connotation of a military presence. So when you render this into English, you need to bear in mind that they are armed, that they come from a ship or a vessel, and so the best way of actually rendering this into English would be a marine. If we wanted to be specific, we would actually say a heavenly marine or a space marine. And, and I think this is really interesting when you go into um, the symbology then of the um, cherubim, which is sometimes, um, if you look at role-playing games and you look at um, the, the Warcraft, again, war is the, denoting the dialectic between human and non-human elements. Um, you have space marines and they are juxtaposed or at war uh, with orcs, which would be the um, seraphic tradition. So we're seeing how these... Um, ancient ideas are playing out within modern culture and modern science fiction. And lastly, at the bottom of the list, we've got the Ishim. Now, the Ishim are man-like or Adamic angels, and indeed, I describe them as Adamic angels. Now, they do appear to be distinct from the Cherubim, because the Cherubim are proto-human angels. They are, if you like, the original source, whereas the Ishim are tweaked, um, from the cherubim. They, they also seem to be combined with an indigenous species on the earth um, to create um, a conduit or a vessel um, which, is, which is able to re reproduce both with the cherubim and also the seraphim angels, which are these non-human angels. Now, as I said before, the seraphim and the cherubim, they work together within the biblical tradition, but they're also antagonisms. And we know that they're antagonisms because within um, Homer and within all of the symbology, uh, we know that there was a war in heaven. It was known as the War of the Titans, in which um, the demigods rebelled against the angels and um, it involved humans, non-humans, and the demigods, and there was a massive war in heaven. And this is encoded with both, both within the biblical symbolism and also within um, Hellenistic um, writing and within classical culture. So, um, they are the two um, groups of angels. As I've said before, then by no means definitive. I think what's interesting is that Ambrose's um, symbolism of angels is referring to the Seraphic or Pythagorean tradition, and we're seeing that uh, Maimondi's representation of the angels is going back to the human um, or grafted element. If we look at the symbology of the lion, um, it, it represents the human element. But there is this connotation because of the lion's association with Orion of a grafted element. So it is looking um, towards this grafted element. So um, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope that I haven't confused my audience too much about all the different um, distinctions of angels, but we do need to be looking at them as this hierarchy, this hierarchy between human and non-human elements, which coalesce together, work together, they work in collusion together, but also that there are factions which have split off, which are antagonistic, and therefore we see this antagonism within the split within the priesthood, which is representing the seraphic and um, the seraphic non-human element and the human element. Okay, if you've enjoyed this video, then please give me a thumbs up. Let's try and make this a, a better world, and let's work together. Um, please share this video and try and. Um, you know, get this information out because this is important information about the scaphological tradition. This has been classified and now we are in a position where we can deconstruct the ancient mythologies and begin to understand what the insignias of um, occult symbolism entail, how they um, how they um, are connected to the symbolism of governments and what this actually means in terms of our governmental structures. So please um, subscribe to my channel and please give me a thumbs up and pass the video around. Thank you very much. This is Pierre Sabak.